All right, 90 degrees. Why do I recommend people use 90 degrees for a majority of their movements? I, I do a lot of posts on the whole 90 degree concept. Uh, some people agree, some people disagree. Uh, oftentimes can be a little bit more vehemently, but I want to use this video to give my rationale for why I use or often recommend 90 degree joint angles for a majority of exercises. So hopefully this maybe clears up a little bit of confusion. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to look at the broad picture of kinesiology. We want to kind of examine all the disciplines and they all need to be congruent with each other. They all need to line up. If they're basically contradicting each other, basically the biomechanics says one thing, but the neuromuscular physiology says something else, we're probably off the track a little bit. If we can get all the disciplines to agree and they're congruent, then we probably know we're closer to finding what's optimal for the human body in terms of uh, physical movement and kinesiology. So, if we look at the biomechanics, the uh, structural or muscle physiology, and then we look at neural or neuromuscular physiology, um, that's the key. So, if we look at biomechanics, things like anatomical levers, okay, uh, simple principles of physics actually, it shows that 90 degree positions or 90 degree joint angles are in fact the strongest, most biomechanically sound positions, not just for producing force, but also for absorbing force. And as a result, uh, it's, it's basically the safest position. It's also where we can perform optimally. And uh, even from a standpoint of sports, it's basically where we want to be in a majority of our, our positions on the field or when we're doing intense physical activity. If we also look at other elements of biomechanics, such as principles of elastic energy, okay? Um, it's, a, it's a concept that's not talked about quite as frequently, but most biomechanists will agree that you want the stiffest usable conditions when it comes to uh, deciding how elastic you want your muscles to be. You don't want them to be overly loose, okay? But you don't want them to be overly tight either, but they generally recommend erring on the side of a tighter, stiffer muscle to create the most elastic energy possible. And a lot of the biomechanics and biomechanists will recommend that the uh, 90, 90 degree position is where you have optimal elastic energy. It's kind of that optimal balance between uh, stiffness and also having some compliance so that it's not overly stiff. Now, if we look at things like muscle physiology or structural physiology of muscle fibers and sarcomere length or the length tension relationship of muscle fibers, uh, basically what it, it shows or suggests is that there's a sweet spot. We don't want the muscles to be overly lengthened. We don't want them to be overly shortened because all those posi positions are essentially uh, compromised and they can not only be potentially uh, dangerous, okay, but it also ingrains into our nervous system some elements of faulty muscular contractions that we don't really want, okay? Um, and then if we look at things like the uh, neural or neuromuscular principles of uh, muscle physiology, okay, we look at things like proprioception, kinesthetic awareness, our muscle spindles and how they provide feedback, that intrinsic feedback, okay, uh, to our body about our positioning, about our sense of feel. The research shows that optimal proprioception occurs when we have high levels of tension and stretch at the same time. If the muscles are not stiff enough, okay, and the muscle is overly lengthened, we actually lose a lot of that proprioceptive feedback. So when you go all the way down into a squat and you just really kind of collapse at the bottom, okay, uh, basically what you're doing is you're sacrificing a lot of that muscle stiffness. And we don't want that because we lose proprioception. Additionally, the research shows co-contraction is a really important element of proper uh, muscle actions, okay? I covered this a little bit in one of my other videos with um, 90 degree eccentric isometrics. But basically, uh, co-contraction of agonist antagonist muscles, it helps us to have the most accurate, okay, and, and optimal contractions, okay? It basically gives us motor control. It allows us to be very precise with our contractions, okay? If we didn't have co-contraction, we would be all over the place. And the eccentric elements is where we want the, that maximal co-contraction to occur. We actually don't want too much of it on the concentric. But the research shows optimal co-contraction occurs at roughly 90 degree joint angles, and the co-contraction element is pivotal for proprioception, okay? So you can see how all this starts tying together. Basically, if we go too deep, we go too far, we overstretch the muscle, use too much range of motion, what ends up happening is we have movements where we have very little sense of feel, we have very little 
proprioceptive feedback and our ability to fine tune movement, our ability to produce a lot of force with the things like the stretch reflex, which is very much dependent and contingent on the muscle spindles doing their job, right? We sacrifice all that. So it starts to become a, a kind of a, a, an issue of why would we want to go deeper, okay? And uh, it's not just a matter of, okay, what we do in the weight room and you know maybe sometimes it's less dangerous or more dangerous. It's also back to the principles of neuromuscular physiology, particularly motor learning, okay? And that's a field of kinesiology that basically describes how we learn skills, okay, our motor control and how it transfers to other skills. How we move in the weight room is ultimately going to trickle into how we move in all areas of life, including on and off the field, okay? If I continually practice larger ranges of motion, okay, beyond 90 degrees, what ends up happening is I teach my nervous system how to continually breach those boundaries of optimal movement, and that's how people tear things. That's how we have a lot of uh, non-contact injuries and some contact injuries as well because you can't absorb force, okay, and, and absorb impact as well when you go past those 90 degree positions. So again, it's not just about what happens in the weight room, it's about how our nervous system takes what we do in here and it transfers that to all areas of life. So we can see why it's, it's so important to make sure we're moving properly when we're doing strength training. Uh, and then there, there's a topic that people get a little confused about and up in arms about saying, well, shear force and compressive forces, uh, which is under the principles of biomechanics, it suggests that 90 degrees is where that happens to its, its highest level, so it's the most dangerous. That would be true if we were talking about robots without a central nervous system. When you actually start looking at how the nervous system works, okay, the strongest position for our muscles to absorb force is 90 degrees. Uh, and so it's not so much about where the most tension or, or stress is coming into the joints. It's more about where do our muscles produce and absorb force maximally, and it's 90 degrees. Because if it wasn't for that, okay, if we said, oh, shear and compressive forces uh, happens maximally at, at 90 degrees, so we want to avoid that, then we would say basically every time someone jumps or someone runs, that they would, they would blow something out, which we know doesn't happen. The other thing we would say is things like the RDL or the hip hinge, okay, we would say that's very dangerous and people shouldn't do that. But we know even though the spine is loaded, it's also one of the most therapeutic and beneficial positions provided the muscles are doing their job properly. Again, if we were talking about a, you know, a robot or an exoskeleton where there's no central nervous system, then maybe the whole sheer compressive forces thing could be applied, but that's pretty much an uh, outdated and antiquated way of looking at things. And additionally, there's also, the, the research is split on that. It's not like everybody says, and not all the research says that uh, shear and compressive forces is maximal at 90. In fact, some of it says the opposite, but regardless, if you go with that argument, it's, it's flawed, it doesn't even work. Um, so anyways, hopefully that clears up some things about why I recommend using 90 degree joint angles on a majority of movements. And it's something that should not be forced. It's something the person should find naturally because if you have proper alignment, okay, proper posture, everything's engaged, everything is tight, feet are activated, you really won't be able to go past 90 degrees whether you want to or not. This is something that I learned uh, pretty early on when I had athletes basically do movements. And I, I told them, hey, keep everything tight, keep everything locked in, fully engaged. Uh, keep that maximal intramuscular stiffness and tension, they all, 100% of the time, hit 90 degrees. It inevitably happens every single time. I have not seen a time where it doesn't happen. If they don't hit 90 degrees, okay, it's because they actually sacrificed some important element of, you know, maybe alignment. They let their foot rotate out or their hip rotate out or lost core tension or maybe lost uh, some element of proper posture. So anyways, give those things a try. If I need to make uh, more videos on any one of those specific topics, I can uh, do that. So hope that helps. Thanks.